Most vertebrate cells form a primary cilium, but there appear to be two distinct pathways of cilia assembly. In some cell types, such as fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells, ciliogenesis begins intracellularly, with the formation of a large ciliary vesicle at the mother centriole. The microtubule-based axoneme also starts to form inside the cell before the ciliary vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane. In polarised epithelial cells, however, the centrosome lacks a large ciliary vesicle and it moves to the apical surface before it begins to assemble the axoneme. Miguel Alonso from the Autonomous University of Madrid explains more. Despite this relevance, research on primary ciliogenesis has concerned itself almost exclusively with the intracellular pathway. But the existence of an alternative route in polarized epithelial cells has remained largely unexplored since the classic work of Sorokin uh, nearly 50 years ago. So we decided to analyze how uh, polarized epithelial cells assemble a primary cilium. Alonso and colleagues, led by Miguel Bernabe Rubio, began by examining where proteins required for ciliogenesis, such as IFT20, RAB8 and the exorcist subunit XO70, localise in polarised epithelial MDCK cells. And what we found very interesting was that in addition to the expected ciliary location, in non ciliated cells, uh, these proteins concentrate in a large tubulin-rich structure that was positioned at the apical surface at their periphery close to the cell junction or central close to the centrosomes. Bernabe Rubio et al. realised that these tubulin-rich structures were the remnants of midbodies, bundles of antiparallel microtubules that form during cytokinesis in the middle of the intercellular bridge between daughter cells. Depending on where the bridge is cleaved at the end of cytokinesis, the midbody can be shed into the extracellular environment or inherited by one of the daughter cells. What we observed was that after severing of the intercellular bridge, the midbody was retained as a remnant by one of the other cells and becomes located at the apical surface close to the cell junction. The next thing we did was try to see whether this uh, peripheral structure then moves to become proximal to the centrosome. And we did this by video microscopy and observed that indeed the remnant moved to the centre of the apical surface to meet the centrosomes. This movement to the centre of the apical surface depended on RAB8, and once the midbody remnant encounters the centrosome, the cell begins to form a primary cilium. To investigate whether the remnant is necessary for ciliogenesis, Bernabe Rubio et al. first tried to destroy the structure by laser ablation, but the energy required to do this caused too much damage to the rest of the cell. So we designed a new gentle procedure that we named DASP, that stands for Take Up by Suction Pressure, it uses a patch clan equipment to aspirate the remnant. And then 24 or 44 hours later, we examined the cells for the presence of a primary cilium. And what we observed was that the removal of the random by task resulted in a four-fold reduction in the number of primary cilia relative to control cells. So our work reveals an unexpected role of the midbody in primary ciliogenesis and highlights a new biological mechanism that links the midbody with the other two microtubule based organelles, the centrosome, and the primary cilium. MDCK cells are known to form primary cilia when they are grown at high density. Bernabe Rubio et al. therefore examined whether cell area influences the midbody remnant's behaviour, and found that cells with a central remnant had an area less than 400 square microns, while cells with a primary cilium had an area less than 200 square microns. So we model this mathematically by measuring parameters such as kinetics of cell growth, the cell area and the conservation of the midbody. And the, the simulation fit very well with the experimental data. So that means that cell area is governing all the transitions of the midbody from the peripheral position to a central position 
and also for the formation of the primary cilium. So we, we think that cell area is important, but what is really important is probably the change from tensiles to compressive force that are caused by cell-cell contact in highly confluent NDCK cells. And this probably triggers the conservation of the RNA, the transitions, and the beginning of ciliogenesis. But how might the mid-body remnant facilitate ciliogenesis once it encounters the centrosome at the centre of the apical surface? Well, we observed by EM analysis of um, serial sections of peripheral and central remnants uh, that the remnant is connected to the rest of the cells by a thin stock. As a matter of fact, we have the test, the establishment of a thin microtubular connection between the remnant and the centrosome when the two organelles meet at the center of the apical surface. So probably somehow this bridge between the centrosome and the midbody can help transfer materials to the centrosome to enable primary cilium formation. Alonso and colleagues now want to investigate how this microtubule bridge is formed and what materials it might transfer to promote cilium assembly. For the moment, though, you can learn more about this novel role for the mid-body in primary cilia genesis by polarised epithelial cells in the paper by Bernabe Rubio et al., published in the August 1, 2016 issue of the Journal of Cell Biology. Oh. <laughs>